everyone, and welcome to the VIA Medical Webinar on Patient Ventilator Interaction. My name is Graham McCourt. I'm the Global KO Manager for Adult Ventilation for VIA Medical. Um, today's lecture will be given by Professor Robert Chatford from the Cleveland Clinic, Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I'm going to read you out his bio because I've known Robert for at least close to 30 years. And I think if I keep reading it, it's going to be much easier, but I'll put down a few words on it so understand I'm reading this. Um, but he's a clinical research manager of the section of respiratory therapy at the Cleveland Clinic. He's also an adjunct professor in the Department of Medicine, uh, Lunar College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve University. He's also the Simulation Fellowship Director of the Cleveland Clinic Simulation Advanced Skills Center. Professionally, Rob has authored nine textbooks, uh, 300 publications and peer-reviewed medical journals. He serves on the editorial board of the journal of Respiratory Care. He's recognized globally as a great ventilation research scientist and authority on ventilation. Basically, he's my go-to guy. Um, it's my pleasure to invite Rob to give this presentation to us on patient ventilator interaction. Thanks, Rob. It's all yours. Thanks, Graham, for that uh, wonderful introduction. I'm going to share my screen now, and you should be able to see my slides. Switching to presentation mode. Perfect. Can you see that? Yeah, this is perfect. Good to go. All right. Well, first of all, the uh, obligatory disclosures. I am a paid consultant for a number of um, companies in the ventilator industry. <clears throat> and I'm also an author of several related textbooks. And in fact, the reason why I put all these uh, photographs up here is that I have written the mechanical ventilation chapters of all these books uh, intentionally so that they all say the same thing. So one of my goals in life is to to try to develop a standardized approach to education and mechanical ventilation. Because it's something that I think that uh, at least the, the respiratory care profession struggles with. What are the objectives today for this talk? Well, first of all, I wanna talk about the basic theory and definitions for patient ventilator interaction. And um, we'll touch upon prior work that I've done in terms of um, a classification or taxonomy for modes of ventilation based on how the ventilator interacts with the patient because a natural extension or evolution of that work is um, going to be a taxonomy for patient ventilator interactions. We will talk about uh, and give definitions for patient ventilator synchrony and distinguish between the terms dyssynchrony and asynchrony because I believe it's useful to do that. And then finally, we'll describe a systematic procedure for identifying patient ventilator synchrony problems at the bedside. Let us start off with some basic theory and definitions. Um, just backing up a little bit, in order to understand patient ventilator interactions, we have to really step back and say, well, how do ventilators work in the first place? And in particular, how do modes interact with patients? And how does the selection of a mode affect patient ventilator um, discordance problems? And this textbook was fairly recent. Uh, I think the most recent edition came out this year. And uh, I wrote the chapter in this book uh, on mechanical ventilation. And I have um, identified named, classified every single mode of every ventilator that I could find that is used in the United States. And amazingly enough, I came up with nearly 500 different names for modes. Now that doesn't mean there's 500 different modes. What that means is there's a lot of overlap and a lot of ambiguity in terms of names. And if you just look at this screen, you can see a bunch of names that are not necessarily intuitively obvious. So that calls upon us to come up with a classification system. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And that classification system gives us the tools to um, understand waveforms uh, at, at the bedside. And this is another thing that's difficult uh, for clinicians to understand, mostly because schools don't have the time to teach it and people have to learn on the job. And it's not the ideal learning situation. And I want to start off this by establishing a motivation for doing this. Now, 
if you were a clinician, how would you feel if your ability to read ECG waveforms was only as good as your ability to read ventilator waveforms? I suspect you would be a little insecure, right? And for that matter, what if your uh, understanding of, of um, drugs, if you were a licensed clinician, you could prescribe drugs. What if your understanding of drugs was no better than your understanding of modes of ventilation? I think then you would say, well, wait a minute, uh, we got to back up a little bit. And that was the motivation for writing this uh, paper, which um, interestingly enough was uh, based on my master's thesis. And this is now, what, some seven years ago. And a related paper was once you can identify um, modes and classify them, and you, you need to understand what their technical specifications are and what are their capabilities that make one mode perhaps more robust than another mode for a given patient um, need. So these two papers are to go together. Once you identify modes and you're able to rationally select amongst all these modes. And then finally, uh, most recently, this paper that we came up with my uh, colleagues and I at the Cleveland Clinic on uh, patient ventilator synchrony. And this was in the context of uh, a couple of years in review as 2019 and a little bit of 2020, all the papers I could find that had been published on this subject. And at the end of this paper, um, we came up with a proposal for, well, first of all, we identified the fact that in all these papers, there was not a shred of, of um, agreement amongst authors in terms of what words they were gonna use or what the definitions were. And so that leaves us at the point where the technology has gotten to a level of complexity where if you don't have a taxonomy or a classification system, then you really can't use the technology very efficiently. And therefore, again, at the end of this paper, if you care to read it, we came up with a proposal for a taxonomy and uh, much of that uh, is expanded upon in this lecture. Now, again, in order to talk about patient ventilator interaction, we first have to understand how ventilators work in the first place. And this goes back to the first paper that I wrote on the um, taxonomy for modes of ventilation. I just wanna go over that briefly so that we're all on the same page and you understand the words that I'm gonna use uh, later on. These 10 maxims are basically um, fundamental concepts of how ventilators are designed and how they interact with the patient. And the very first concept is that, well, a ventilator is designed to deliver breaths to patients, right? So we have to define a, vent, uh, a breath, at least in terms of the way the ventilator thinks of it. So it turns out that we define a breath in terms of the flow and time waveform. And the convention is that inspiration is positive flow and expiration is negative flow. If there's an inspiratory hold, a period of no flow, we, we lump that in with inspiration. At least that's how most, if not all ventilator manufacturers do it. Now, another term that is often misunderstood in, in the clinical literature is this word assisted. Um, oftentimes you'll find a manufacturers uh, suggesting that a, a breath is assisted if the patient triggers it. So they get the words assist and trigger mixed up. But assisting really means that the ventilator does some work on the patient. And how do you know if the ventilator is doing work on the patient? Well, pressure rises during inspiration. What's inspiration? Well, it's positive flow. So if you force gas into the patient's respiratory system and, and the pressure rises, then that does work. So work then is a function of, of both uh, volume change and pressure change. And now we come to the third maxim, which is perhaps the most important central concept in all of mechanical ventilation and pulmonary function for that matter, as far as I'm concerned. And that is that the respiratory system is modeled mathematically or physically as um, a system that has pressure and volume changes and is described in terms of what we call the equation of motion. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that we have, in this case, a graphical model, which can be simulated with a physical model, like you've all heard of a straw connected to a balloon. And this is supposed to represent a very complex system of airways in the, in the patient. And the reason why we do this is because it allows us to describe the interaction of the patient and the ventilator 
with only three basic variables. One is the pressure difference across the system causing flow. The other is flow in and out of the system. And the other is the volume change within the system. Now, once we do this, we can start relating these variables such that we can define a mechanical property called resistance as a relationship of pressure and flow. And in a similar fashion, we can talk about the elastic mechanical property of the system as a change in pressure and volume. Although sometimes in practice, we'll talk about compliance, which is just the reciprocal of this. And all of this is summarized in what's called the equation of motion for the respiratory system, where we have pressure as a function of time, volume as a function of time, and flow as a function of time. And um, E elastance is a, a constant, a parameter, and R is also assumed to be constant in the parameter. And this, in fact, even though it looks sort of like an algebraic equation, is in fact a first order linear differential equation, which is signified by that dot. That dot is the derivative of volume with respect to time, or what we think of in clinically as flow or change in volume per change in time. Um, the next concept that we need to get um, some agreement on is that inspiration is started and stopped by the ventilator, uh, according to uh, the values of some variables that it monitors. And we call the start of inspiration the trigger event and the stopping of expiration or inspiration as the cycle event. And the inspiratory time is the duration between the trigger and cycle events. And another important concept is that either the uh, patient or the ventilator can be responsible for these triggering and cycling events. And we can also mix them up. And based on th these two maxims here, then we can see that there are only two kinds of breaths, spontaneous breaths, which we define as those which are both triggered and cycled by the patient versus mandatory breaths, which are either triggered or cycled by the machine. In other words, anytime the machine gets involved in triggering and cycling, then the patient loses some control over the timing of the breaths, and we're going to call that mandatory. And that helps us out uh, further down the road because we can say, well, now all modes of ventilation can be categorized in terms of three breath sequences, right? They can either be all mandatory, which we call continuous mandatory ventilation, or they can all be all spontaneous, which we call continuous spontaneous ventilation. Or of course, there can be a mixture, which we call intermittent mandatory ventilation. I suppose we could have called it intermittent spontaneous ventilation, but for historical reasons, uh, it's IMV. Now, when we pair the control variables of pressure or volume, um, which again are derived from the equation of motion, you're either controlling the left-hand side of the equation, which is pressure, or you're controlling the right-hand side of the equation, which is volume. And you pair that with the, the breath sequences, and we come up with five generic breath sequences, volume-controlled CMV and IMV, and pressure control, CMV, IMV, and CSV. And that makes uh, classifying these hundreds of names of modes of ventilation much more practical. Now, of course, um, there are many more modes than just five. And the way we distinguish these modes and, and the way they have evolved over time is that they have become uh, more and more sophisticated in their feedback control schemes which we call targeting schemes. And finally, um, we put this all together. We have a classification system or a taxonomy, which is basically any mode can be specified or classified in terms of its pressure, or its control variable, either pressure, in which case um, either you have a preset inspiratory pressure target or inspiratory pressure is controlled by the ventilator to be proportional to inspiratory effort, like NAVA and, and PAV and modes like that. Or we have a volume control mode, in which case, because on the right-hand side of the equation of motion, there are two variables, this, this implies that volume control means the operator presets both the tidal volume and the inspiratory flow waveform. Uh, next comes the breath sequence, which we already mentioned, and I um, will further specify that there are four different kinds of IMV, something that we might talk about a little bit later on. It's very important in distinguishing um, 
the or identifying the evolution of IMV over time has become very important. And I would argue that someday all modes will be some form of IMV, probably at the time when uh, ventilators are all controlled by artificial intelligence and they don't need us too much. And as I mentioned before, there are these seven basic targeting schemes that are currently used on, on virtually every ventilator that I've been able to see. And um, we don't have time to go into this too, in too much detail, but these are all described in our um, my previous papers. Now, um, let's talk about the theoretical framework for waveform interpretation. And unfortunately, the way waveform interpretation is often taught is just a matter of pattern recognition. So in other words, someone will show you a waveform and they'll say, well, this is reverse triggering. And every time you see that, that's what it is. And it just comes down to memorization, which doesn't really lend itself to you understanding too much about what's going on in terms of patient ventilator interaction. Why does this happen? So again, uh, the theoretical framework for patient ventilator interaction and, and understanding waveforms uh, is again, based upon this equation of motion for the respiratory system. And again, here we see uh, the pressure generated by the ventilator. Um, and here we see a standard waveform for volume control. This is the, the imaginary uh, variable that we call muscle pressure. It's the, it's the pressure that would have been generated by the ventilator um, if the patient was connected to a ventilator. Or, or if not, then obviously you and I right now are sitting here generating some force. We call that muscle pressure with our ventilatory muscles. So these two ventilator, uh, these two pressures act together to generate volume and flow uh, according to the elastance and resistance of the respiratory system. And I will point out that all of these terms are in units of pressure because if you multiply elastance times volume, you get units of pressure. And if you multiply resistance times flow, you get units of pressure. And in this case, um, again, these waveforms here, this is the a standard waveform for flow. This is a, a simple constant flow waveform here. And as a result of that, we get a linear rise, a triangular shaped volume waveform. And if you add these two together, you get a, a somewhat um, rectangular, well, you get basically a, a triangle on top of a rectangle for the pressure waveform. And we call this volume to control if the operator can preset, as I said, both volume and flow. Now in some modes you can set volume but not flow and sometimes that's confused with a form of volume control but by this taxonomy is not. You have to have these two criteria. Now what happens uh, in terms of the waveforms is that for volume control the right hand side of the equation is preset, right? So any change in lung mechanics is not going to affect the volume or flow. What does it affect? It affects the other side of the equation. So in this case, if we increase resistance, we're going to see the increase in the resistive component of this waveform. On the other hand, if we see an increase in elastance, we'll see an increase in the slope of this pressure rise. And if we get an increase in the muscle pressure on the other side, um, what we see is a scooping out of the pressure waveform. Now, why would that happen? Well, it's because, again, the right-hand side of the equation is controlled. So that means that the pressures on this side are the same. And if the ventilator settings do not change, this pressure doesn't change. So if this pressure goes up, this pressure must go down, look scooped out in order for the total pressure to remain constant. Now, if this is the first time you've heard that, you might have to think that through a little bit, but you can obviously see this at the bedside and that's why you see it. Now, not everybody uses a constant flow for volume control. And in fact, at our institution, we tend to like to use a, what we call a descending ramp flow, sometimes called a decelerating flow, but that's a kind of ambiguous term. But if you set the ventilator with a particular tidal volume and, and descend, a descending ramp flow waveform, then this is what the volume waveform will look like. And the pressure waveform will again be a function of the right-hand side of the equation. And it'll look something like this. And now, if the elastance increases, what we're going to see is a larger end um, inspiratory pressure. And in fact, if this 
waveform is set so that the flow is zero at end inspiration, then this term goes to zero and all you have is the elastic pressure. So in that specific case, the end inspiratory pressure is the plateau pressure. And you don't even have to do an inspiratory hold, which some sick patients can't tolerate. So that's a, a nice little tip to keep in mind. Again, if resistance increases, that, uh, that resistance uh, hitting the high flow at, at the beginning of inspiration causes a high inspiratory pressure. And then as the flow decays, the resistance pressure drops over time until it goes to zero, and if, if, if it does. Although in some ventilators, you can set the end inspiratory um, flow to some percentage of the peak flow. Again, not sure why we do that, but it is possible. And once again, if there is muscle pressure, um, any increase in muscle pressure will cause a decrease or scooping out of the airway pressure, simply because this side of the equation is constant. And in order for this side of the equation to be constant, if this goes up, that has to go down. That's true of all forms of volume control ventilation. Now let's talk about the idea of work shifting. Um, again, now we're seeing pressure, volume, and flow waveforms idealized like you might see in um, a, a ventilator uh, display. And here we see that muscle pressure is equal to zero. In other words, the patient is making no inspiratory efforts. And that means all of the work is being done by the ventilator. There's no distortion in the pressure waveform. And we say there's no work shifting. Here, we see a small um, increase in the muscle pressure at the be somewhere in the middle of the inspiration. This rise and fall of the red curve is the muscle pressure. In this case, it's pretty small. It's only say three centimeters. It could happen anywhere uh, during inspiration. It happened, if it happened at the beginning, it would probably be used to trigger the um, inspiration on. But in this case, as you can see, to the extent to which the muscle pressure rises, the airway pressure must drop. And this deformation in the pressure waveform is our indication that there is work being shifted. What do we mean by work shifting? It means, well, the ventilator work is proportional to the mean inspiratory pressure and the volume being delivered. So you can see clearly that the mean area pressure is less, the area under the pressure waveform is less, and therefore the ventilator is certainly not doing as much work as it did here. And why not? It's because the patient is doing this much work. And the extreme case of this is sometimes called flow starvation, right? So you can actually see sometimes when the airway pressure drops even below baseline pressure. And then as a matter of fact, during that brief period of time, the patient is actually doing work on the ventilator. This is not a situation that you want to see clinically. Now, work shifting, the degree to which it happens is highly affected by the mode of ventilation that you choose for the patient. So for example, in volume control modes, either true volume control or pressure control modes with adaptive targeting where you can set a tidal volume and the ventilator adjusts pressure up or down according to the, to the patient inspiratory effort. What you see happening is that for zero muscle effort, if the patient is completely passive, then the pressure from the ventilator is undistorted. But as the pressure, uh, muscle pressure or the patient effort increases over time, or it just increases, then the ventilator will decrease the pressure output and it will decrease its work output. And you can see that again in the distortion of the airway pressure waveform. Now, if you are in a pressure control mode, straight up pressure control, like pressure support or pressure control, CMV or IMV, then the, we are controlling airway pressure and it is independent of what the patient does. So actually the work per liter of tidal volume remains constant regardless of how much work the patient does. So the extra work that the patient does simply contributes to delivering a, a larger tidal volume. So now if we have a line going down, a line going across, you can imagine what comes next, right? A line going up. What this indicates is that as the patient muscle pressure or the patient inspiratory effort increases, the ventilator increases its pressure output and its work output. What modes do that? Well, Pressure control with uh, adaptive target or with a uh, servo targeting 
And this is essentially a proportional assist ventilation, neurally adjusted ventilatory assist or NAVA, and also tube compensation if you want to consider that a mode. So you can see there's a vast difference in the way the ventilator responds in terms of applying or, or um, assistance, providing assistance for the patient's inspiration, depending on what the patient does and depending on the mode you choose. Now, let's talk about patient ventilator interactions and some terminology associated with that. And then once we have those basics under our belt, we can talk about uh, how to apply all this at the bedside. First of all, if you look up the word synchrony in a dictionary, it simply means a simultaneous action or occurrence. And dyssynchrony means the opposite, a lack of proper synchrony. And asynchrony means an an absence or a lack of occurrence in time. Occurrence of what? Well, synchrony means that you have two different signals. And if the two signals go up and down together, we call that synchrony. If they don't, we call that dyssynchrony. And if one of the signals is missing for some reason, we'll call that asynchrony. What's that got to do with mechanical ventilation? Well, the reference signal in, in all forms of um, synchrony evaluation has to be what the patient's doing. And ideally that should be muscle pressure. Although um, muscle pressure can, has actually been measured and monitored at the bedside. And in fact, it's hidden within the mode called proportional assist ventilation. Uh, we rarely are able to see that directly uh, as a display on mechanical ventilators, but we can see indications of that and we'll talk about it. A surrogate for muscle pressure might be esophageal pressure. Here we're seeing muscle pressure displayed as a negative value. Mathematically, it's always positive, but sometimes on some simulators and some displays, it's shown as negative. You can think of this as esophageal pressure if you like. So this is our reference signal. And the signal that's supposed to respond to that in synchrony is the airway pressure waveform or the, what we call P-Vent. So P-Vent, P-MUS are your two signals. You want those to be in synchrony. This is the start of inspiration and the end of inspiration according to the PMUS signal, but yet you'll see there's a little time delay before you get a start of inspiration according to the ventilator and the end of inspiration is way out of here. So there's a delay, delay in these things on, in almost all cases for virtually all modes of ventilation. We can just say that straight up. Now, another concept that is useful um, and has been promulgated and described great, to a great deal by Christopher Sinderby and his group because they have a NAVA signal, uh, basically a diaphragmatic EMG, which is a good substitute for a muscle pressure signal. But we can think in terms of a neural inspiratory time, you know, what the brain thinks the inspiratory time should be. So that would be this, and the neural expiratory time would be this. So this is where the diaphragm is contracting and here's where the diaphragm is relaxing and, or not doing anything. Uh, in contrast, we have a ventilator inspiratory time, which in this case is preset, although it may be indirectly set in a mode like pressure support according to um, the uh, uh, flow cycling criteria. And then we have a, a usually a preset expiratory time, which is set essentially by the frequency, uh, mandatory breath frequency, once the inspiratory time is set. So these are things to keep in mind as we're talking about synchrony problems. Now, things start to get a little bit more complicated. If you look in the literature about um, research along these lines, uh, again, there's some reference points in the muscle pressure waveform. The start of the PMUS is here. The peak of the PMUS is here. The end of it is here. And again, the corresponding um, changes in the airway pressure waveform. Here's the start of the event, P vent. Here's the peak of vent, P vent. Here you see the peak happens way before the peak of the, um, the patient. And here's the end, which happens way after. So you can see there's all kinds of opportunities for um, synchrony problems to crop up. Uh, and again, we said before, there's a neural inspiratory time from here to here. There's a neural expiratory time from here to here. And yet there is a, a ventilator set inspiratory time and expiratory time, which in this case, on this graphic, with mandatory breaths, is not very synchronous at all. 
Now, if you look in the literature, they uh, often talk about phase difference and they find, they describe various ways of describing or measuring the phase difference. The simplest way would be to um, simply look at um, the time at T1 uh, versus the time at uh, T0 of muscle pressure. In other words, the difference between the start of um, the muscle pressure waveform versus the start of, of the of ventilator pressure waveform. Or you could think of it in terms of uh, the difference in terms of the peak values, which would give you a different number. The phase difference can be described as a percent of either the inspiratory time or the expiratory time. And perhaps most confusing of all, phase difference can be described in terms of degrees, which is more of an, an engineering way of looking at things. And I won't go into that much more at this point, but again, you'll find these things if you look in the literature. Um, again, synchrony means that there's a near zero phase difference between patient demand and ventilator response. You're never going to find zero phase difference because no ventilator uh, can operate without any kind of time lag. Now, the demand that the ventilator is looking at, um, uh, at least in terms of uh, graphically analyzing waveforms, a reference pressure is either going to be esophageal pressure or if we have it, uh, the electrical signal from the diaphragm, but if we get it from a Nava catheter. Now you can do this kind of analysis with a simulator that actually generates PMUS, which is what I showed you on those prior waveforms. Now that's the demand in terms of the patient side. The response is either going to be ventilator pressure or ventilator flow. This synchrony means what? It means that there's a clinically important phase difference, the phase difference that we talked about in the prior slide, between the patient demand and the ventilator response. Again, Clinically important is a value judgment. I, I don't think there's a whole lot of evidence in the literature to, to guide us on what clinically important phase difference is. When is it important? When is it not? When does it hurt the patient? When, it, when is it something you can ignore? But it's something that is a subject of much research clinically. And again, asynchrony means just one of these signals is gone. Either an absence of the patient demand there's no evidence of an inspiratory effort, or there's an inspiratory effort and no ventilator response. Now, before we go any further, I want to show you a little tool that you have access to. Um, I, I imagine that you will have the, the access to these slides or to the videotape. If you go to this, uh, if you use this link on this website, you will be able to download a patient ventilator simulator that I designed it runs on any ventilator that has Excel. And you can see that it allows you to simulate volume control ventilation, pressure control ventilation with mandatory breaths and pressure support. And there's some other information associated with it, equations and a glossary and things like that. But without going too much in detail, essentially what the simulator lets you do is create a lung model which is comprised of a compliance and a resistance. You just use these arrow buttons, go up and down, put in what, any values that you want that represent either a normal patient or a patient with COPD or a patient with any of three levels of ARDS. You can do the same thing for resistance. And then there's an effort model. So the, the simulation has two components, a lung model and an effort model. And here the effort model is um, basically how you shape this little red curve. This is your muscle pressure waveform. It's uh, simulated as a sinusoidal wave, but you can adjust um, how long it is, the, the duration of the effort, and uh, the delay uh, after the start of the ventilator effort. Or you can cause it to trigger the inspiration in the pressure support mode. And then you have these sort of genetic, or rather generic variables for um, the mode. So uh, in this case, uh, you can set volume control as a square inspiratory flow waveform or a ramp inspiratory waveform if you wanted to. You can set the waveform, uh, the flow, peak flow, tidal volume. You can set the frequency of the mandatory breast, the peep, and the pause time if you want, just like you can on a ventilator. Down here, you see a whole bunch of calculated values. Things like the cycle time, I time, E time, duty cycle, plateau pressures, all this other stuff 
mean airway pressure, things that many ventilators will display for you. And over here, you see a graphical representation, which should be familiar to you because that's what a ventilator looks like. You get the pressure waveform at the top, you get the volume in the middle, and you get the flow at the bottom. And this is a really great tool to get familiar with how changes in lung mechanics uh, change either the pressure waveform and volume control or the volume and flow waveforms and pressure control. Great teaching tool. Okay, let's try to put all this together. There have been papers written attempting to describe various ways to collect data to evaluate patient ventilator synchrony. And this is a pretty good paper. And it indicates that um, what you can do is you can collect ventilator waveforms. Um, the, good, the good thing about this is it's non-invasive. It's easily available. Uh, some ventilators will allow you to do screenshots or even export waveforms that you can analyze offline. The disadvantage, of course, is that it needs expertise, the kind of expertise that we're talking about today. Um, currently, there is no automated analyses for ventilators that I am aware of, but there are software packages that are being developed as standalone, and certainly someday we're going to see this built into ventilators. Now, if you have uh, a signal that you can use as a reference signal that greatly uh, simplifies your analysis of patient ventilator synchrony, uh, probably the gold standard would be the electric, electrical activity of the diaphragm, and that depicts the, the diaphragm activity, which is a good surrogate for PMOS. It's continuous, it's quantified. Um, it's not that difficult to get if you have an alpha catheter and, and a servo ventilator that can collect the data for you. But of course, it does need a dedicated catheter. It does not detect other muscles. So a patient could be breathing with their accessory muscles, have a paralyzed diaphragm, and you'd be scratching your head as, how's this guy breathing? which I've actually seen at least once. Another gold standard that you can use is esophageal pressure. And more ventilators nowadays are coming with uh, modules that will allow you to uh, place a, a standard um, esophageal catheter into any patient and then take that pressure and put it into a port on the ventilator and it will display uh, the esophageal pressure for you and give you waveforms and do calculations um, and that's a, a really good way to go as well. Uh, and finally, as I mentioned, um, software is being developed. Um, it's continuous, it's automatic, it's real time, and there's more and more artificial intelligence being built into it. There are not that many studies yet, but if you go back um, to that paper that I mentioned earlier, my review of the 2019 papers on synchrony, I've, I've uh, cataloged all of the software products that were available at that time very interesting reading and it gives you a good idea of where we're going. Again, this is the paper I mentioned. There's a table in there that I'm not going to go over. It's going to be way too demanding, but essentially the, the concept that we we'd we like to suggest is that you look for patient ventilator synchronies in one of the four phases of the breath, right? So there's a trigger phase, the start of inspiration. There's the inspiratory phase. There's the cycle phase which is the cycle event where inspiration cycles off, and then there's the expiratory phase. These, these phases are familiar to all of us. But what we want to say is that there is a simple and universal approach to classifying all the waveforms um, and the synchrony problems that we see um, in terms of early, late, false, or failed triggers, early, late, false, or failed cycles. So there's some sort of symmetry here in the inspiration, inspiratory phase, we can talk about work shifting. And also in the expiratory phase, we can see evidence of muscle pressure and work shifting is there as well. And these account for all different kinds of things that we would see both in terms of dyssynchrony and asynchrony and work shifting. And I won't go into all of these names, um, but we will talk about a few of them here in just a minute. Now at the clinic, we have developed a standardized sort of rubric or algorithm for um, going to the bedside and having someone look at the waveform, even if they know nothing about the ventilator itself, just looking at the waveform, being able to create a tag, which is we call a taxonomic attribute, attribute grouping or 
basically just a classification of the mode according to those um, the mode taxonomy that, that was described in the paper earlier. And the fellows and the respiratory therapists at our institution have been thoroughly uh, trained in this, or at least we're in the process of doing that. So they can look at just the waveform and come up with a generic classification of the mode independent of what the manufacturer calls it. And again, as I mentioned earlier, you do this by identifying the control variable, the breath sequence, and the targeting scheme. In this case, we have uh, simplified the targeting schemes. There are more than that. We just simplified it to the, to the modes that are available to us at the Cleveland Clinic. Of course, it can be expanded uh, for, for wherever you are. Then we talk about the load. Again, the load is the pressure against which the, vena, the P vent or the muscle of the ventilator must work. Uh, it can be an elastic load due to a higher elastance generally. It could be uh, a resistive load generally due to a high resistive, resistance, or it could be a PMUS load indicating a high effort or a high PMUS. And then once we've defined the load, we come down and define the interaction in terms of which phase of the breath we're in, the trigger phase, the inspiratory phase, uh, the cycle phase, or the expiratory phase. And finally, all this leads up to okay, if we see a problem here in terms of load or patient ventilator interaction and it's not optimal, what are you gonna do about it? Well, first of all, you have to define what's the goal of ventilation. And, and, and we like to say there's only three goals, like there's only three goals in life, I'd say, safety, comfort, and liberation. Safety meaning gas exchange and, uh, and adequate support of um, or adequate lung protection, comfort in terms of adequate assistance or support of work and liberation meaning early weaning. So if you find a problem with the ventilator, patient ventilator interaction, such that you're not serving the goal that you want, then you need to suggest setting changes or mode changes or some other intervention like perhaps uh, paralysis. Now, this is how it works. And this is just a very simple generic bedside approach to how we do this. So the first thing is to identify the mode tag, which means the control variable, the breath sequence and the targeting scheme. In this case, we identify there's a constant inspiratory flow. And the only way that could ever happen is if you control it, which means you have volume control. And we have volume cycling and volume control, which means every breath is mandatory by definition. And that means um, the breath sequence is continuous mandatory ventilation. If you look at the waveform, every breath appears to have the same um, inspiratory time, the same constant uh, volume and flow. And therefore, we have no indication of any spontaneous breath. So this can't be IMV or CMV. It has to be uh, IMV or CSV. It has to be CMV. And furthermore, we can identify that all targets are operator preset. So we would call this set point targeting. Again, this requires a familiarity and essentially memorizing what these targeting schemes mean. Uh, you can get all of that from the papers that I described before. Now, the second step is to identify the load. An elastic load means a decrease in compliance or an increase in elastance, either way you want to look at it. A resistive load typically means an increase in resistance. And a PMUS load means that there's either inspiratory or expiratory effort. Here, in this case, we see a high initial pressure, which we know from the equation of motion means that there's a high peak flow hitting a high resistance. And so that indicates a high resistance and furthermore, we see there's a long expiratory time constant, which again indicates um, generally a high resistance. Although it could be because of a high compliance, we just don't see it that often. <clears throat> again, that, that, that means that you have to be familiar with the, the idea of a time constant, how it's defined and, and how, it's, how it relates to normal lungs or uh, sick lungs. And here we see in the expiratory flow waveform, a little bump towards inspiration. And that's our indication of an inspiratory effort, um, unsuccessful one, as you can see, um, during the expiratory phase. And the third step is to identify the synchrony issue. We look at the trigger phase. Here we see a failed uh, trigger effort. The patient made a trigger effort. The flow did not go through zero. So the ventilator didn't even know the patient was attached. So here's an example. This is a real waveform. Um, 
from a, I think these are waveforms that I created with a, a ventilator connected to a lung simulator so that I can control the situation and make it look nice and idealized. Now, the tag we're gonna say is pressure control, continuous mandatory ventilation with set point targeting. And how do we know that? Well, we have a constant inspiratory pressure. And the only way you're gonna get a constant pressure is if you control it. Uh, we have a non-constant flow Generally, we see a high peak inspiratory flow that decays more or less exponentially. This is a passive breath, and that's what you want to see. Um, what's the, lo the load? We say there's work shifting because there's evidence of PMUS. How do you know that? Well, this breath is uh, passive, but this breath, the patient is making an active inspiratory effort. How do you know? Well, because this is what happens if the patient doesn't do anything. And if the patient adds pressure to the left-hand side of the equation of motion, then that means you're gonna get more flow and volume on the right-hand side of the equation. You see more flow because flow is distorted in the positive direction and you see more volume because you get a higher tidal volume. What then is the patient ventilator interaction? How would we classify that? Well, here is the classical situation of what is called in the literature reverse trigger, but more precisely, according to this taxonomy, this is an early trigger, meaning that the ventilator triggered inspiration first, and then the patient subsequently triggered, um, tried to make a trigger effort during the preset inspiratory time. So the patient effort came after, and the, or you could say in this case, the ventilator triggered before the uh, reference signal, which is the patient, so we call that an early trigger. Here's another example. What's the tag? Again, we recognize that this is pressure control from the pressure waveform and the flow and volume waveforms. We say that the load is normal, mostly because the expiratory time constant looks normal and that we have a nice high peak expiratory flow and a reasonable expiratory time constant over the course of a couple of seconds. So we don't see any indication of high resistance um, or elastance. But here we have evidence of a late trigger. How do we know that? Well, here's where the patient made the inspiratory effort. You can see that either in the pressure waveform or the flow waveform, it took a long time for the ventilator to catch up. And on this ventilator, you can see that it's a pressure trigger because uh, the ventilator indicates uh, a section in white on the pressure waveform. If this had been a flow trigger, the section in white would have been on the um, flow waveform instead of the pressure waveform. Here's another example. Here we see volume control, continuous mandatory ventilation. Well, how do we know that? Again, we see constant flow. You're only gonna get that if you're controlling it. Every single breath has the same inspiratory time, so it's volume cycled. So these are all mandatory breaths. And um, we have the non-constant pressure rise that we would expect to see in pressure control. What's the load? It's not clear. Why is it not clear? Because looking down here, we see a big inspiratory volume, a very small expiratory volume, and this big reset back to zero. The ventilator is just resetting the uh, volume waveform because the next inspiration is starting. And what that means is, um, what that means is then we have a large leak and um, in this case, it's a false trigger and we can identify that from a high respiratory rate. Example number four, what is the tag here? Again, this is pressure control, continuous mandatory ventilation. We get that again from the waveforms. Now these are not as ideal as we, we'd like to see because ventilators are not as good at controlling pressure as they are at controlling flow. So you will see some distortion of the pressure waveform and pressure control if the patient is making inspiratory efforts. So what's the load? We see a muscle pressure during inspiration here. It's, it's uh, increased over what we'd expect to see for an, an exponential decay. We see a normal expiration because there's a nice exponential decay here. And we would call this work shifting because again of the distorted inspiratory flow and uh, the augmentation of the tidal volume. And in fact, in a situation like this, you might get an excess of tidal volume above a safe limit of, you know, six to eight mLs per kilogram. Another example, here we have 
volume control, continuous mandatory ventilation. Again, we know this from the flow waveform, but the pressure waveform is, is dramatically distorted. We see that during inspiration, um, the, the pressure waveform goes way below the expiratory pressure, sort of like, looks like an inverse pressure waveform. And this is what we call extreme work shifting, or in this case, because the, because the inspiratory pressure goes below baseline pressure, we would call that low starvation. Again, this is a, a bad sign clinically, and you'd want to do something to address it. Another example, here we have pressure control, continuous mandatory ventilation. We can recognize this from the pressure of volume and flow waveforms. We have a, um, a normal expiration except for this area right here. And what's happening is that the peak expiratory flow is being distorted because the, um, you have a high end expiratory flow. There's, a, there's an early cycle, meaning that the inspiratory time set on the ventilator is shorter than the neural expiratory time that the patient is trying to breathe at. So the patient's inspiratory effort is bleeding over into the expiratory time. And we can see that by the distortion towards positive flow of the peak expiratory flow curve. That's a good sign. Another example, pressure control again. Um, here we see work shifting because we don't see the nice exponential decay in flow. It's billowed up, it's, a, it's increased flow because of the muscle pressure. And we're got, we call this late cycling because uh, we see this pressure rise at end inspiration. What's happening here is that the patient is making an inspiratory effort and relaxing, in this case against uh, an expiratory hold, a closed um, um, exhalation valve. And so as the patient relaxes, the airway pressure rises um, briefly. This may or may not have any clinical significance, um, but that indicates that the, um, the, the neural inspiratory time is shorter than the preset inspiratory time. Now, I wanna close with saying that we offer every other Tuesday, what we call SEVA event round. SEVA stands for Standardized Education and Ventilatory Assistance. This is an online um, interactive um, explanation of actual patient um, ventilator interactions. We have screenshots from ventilators attached to patients. We go through this three-stage process and we take questions and comments from the audience. Um, there is a course called My Learning that's available to the public that goes over the, the basically the 10 maxims, the fundamentals of mode taxonomy, and a little bit about ventilator graphics. There's a free ventilator um, mode map app that runs on both um, um, uh, Android and iPhones. It was developed by the Cleveland Clinic and allows you to classify every mode on every ventilator that at least it's used in the United States. And I'll close with this with a graphic that my inspiration from all this is that the diaphragm contracts while the chest expands. And with that, I will stop. And I believe we have a few minutes for questions. Well, Rob, that was great. Um, obviously, for the, 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 um, the attendees, they are obviously brainwashed with your formulas and <laughs> viewpoints on it. But it's important because, you know, in today in the ventilation world, and, and you and I have been a, a part of this for a long time, anybody who's been trained today is being exposed to the newer modes of ventilation. And those of us who've come through the, the other way have been brought up with the old modes of ventilation. Do you actually feel, in, in your opinion, that the new modes of ventilation do offer clinical benefit based on the algorithms, or do you think as clinicians, we still know best about, you know, making changes ourselves? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, as you know, there's a wide range of skill in clinicians at the bedside, and a really experienced clinician can probably ventilate anybody with any ventilator, or, or the most primitive ventilator, right? And unfortunately, we've probably seen examples of this when our ventilator inventory ran low during the COVID pandemic. But aside from that, the paper that we, I mentioned earlier on the rational framework for selecting modes, 
that lists a whole bunch of modes, not all of them that are available, but it lists their technical capabilities that make them more or less robust in terms of serving the three goals of ventilation, which again are safety, comfort, and liberation. So simple modes like at the bottom of the list, volume control, CMV or volume assist control, like everybody likes to call it, only offers one thing and that's safety. And that's preset minute ventilation, end of story. At the other end of the extreme, we have modes that actually have artificial intelligence built in, monitors the patient condition, adjusts on a breath by breath basis over time, which no clinician can do for if for no other reason, we're not at the bedside. And in between those two extremes is a whole host of ventilator technical capabilities using combinations of these targeting schemes and it gets very complicated. So I think what's gonna happen at the end of the day is we're gonna be driven to work by a car that has artificial intelligence and no driver. And we're gonna go into the ICU and we're gonna have a little black box that says connect patient. Okay, disconnect patient. <laughs> and you go about your business. And everything in between is gonna be run by artificial intelligence. My vision for the future is that when we get to the internet of things, you know, where all medical equipment is communicating amongst themselves through networks, sharing information and being controlled and observed by massive, nearly human artificial intelligence that learns from its experience, then this whole paradigm of a human being at the bedside tweaking the knobs is gonna go out the door. And, I, and it's happening right now, right? We know this is already, we're on that road right now. I think it's a long discussion because oh, yeah. we start running about different modes. Hey, um, so Rob, we have a couple of questions um, and I'll, I'll read them out to you. So let's see if I get it right. One is from Daniel Raleigh and um, Daniel writes, do you think that um, a, a pressure waveform will be superimposed with the airway pressure, like an alveolar pressure waveform will be superimposed with the airway pressure waveform? With an astute eye, can you identify whether alveolar pressure is equal to less than or greater than airway pressure? A real-time visual would be helpful. That would be, um, what's he trying to say? Sorry, the writing is a bit small. Somehow um, superimpose the airway pressure or with diaphragmatic monitoring outside of the NAVA mode. So it's obviously about NAVA, I think. That's, that's an incredible question, right? Well, yeah, is. first of all, as, as it refers to alveolar pressure, the only way to get alveolar pressure is to open the chest wall, poke a hole in the lungs and stick a pressure capsule on. And I have done that in animals, okay? No one's gonna do that at the bedside. The next best thing is to estimate alveolar pressure if you can estimate airway resistance, right? And there's at least one ventilator that has an algorithm for doing those things. How useful is that? I don't know. Um, I would say that to the extent to which we have signals that represent muscle pressure, like NAVA or esophageal pressure, that is gonna help us um, to fine tune um, patient ventilator synchrony. And I think again, because of the vast uh, quantity of signals and how they change over time, we're gonna to have to rely on more and more on automation, artificial intelligence to help us do that. Hopefully, Daniel, you're, you're impressed with the answer. Okay. Uh, Ariel um, has got a question for you, Rob. Um, when we connect an artificial controller with a natural one, the relationship between them will always not be perfect different points in time. Of course, that's right. Do you think that we have to target the minimum amount of not ideal interaction since we cannot have a perfect one at all time? Yeah, well, the artificial controller is a vent and the natural controller is the brain, right? Right. And amazingly enough, there has actually been at least one paper where some engineers controlled a ventilator with brain signals directly from the EEG. Um, but yeah, um, we have to find ways to improve synchrony. And it's never going to be perfect if for no other reason than 
there is some momentum, right? A volume of gas has physical momentum. It takes time to accelerate that into the lungs. And it's never gonna be like a breathing in from the atmosphere, which has an infinite capacity to provide you with the flow that you want. If you have to suck the flow out of some kind of box, there's always gonna be some delay. But the ideally, ideally you want to keep that delay, both in terms of triggering and cycling and, and peak flow, you want those delays and phase, phase shifts to be as minimal as possible. And we've seen a tremendous different uh, evolution over time in, in achieving this, both in modes like PAV and NAVA, which are, as, as far as I'm concerned, as close as you can get right now in terms of synchrony. Uh, thinking back, you know, I've been in this business a long time, thinking back to the days when all we had was a period in Bennett MA1, all it did was volume assist control. And <laughs> the patient didn't like that. Well, too bad, you know. Yeah, can't argue with that. I can remember the same thing myself. Um, a question from Sharon. Um, great talk, which is all very positive. Is the CEBA training only available in North America? I know the answer is no. No. Um, the the SAVA program um, currently has two levels uh, that, are uh, that are online. They are for free. Um, you can get them through that uh, link that I showed you. Um, it, that link will take you to a, a section of our IT uh, system that's called My Learning. That's where all of the, the employees take these, the required training and all that stuff. But these are open to the public, they're free and, and they're self-directed. So yeah, save a level one and level two. Level two, like I said, level one is the basics of the, the 10 maxims and, and how to identify and classify modes. But level two is where you actually use the simulator that I showed you on your computer. And there's a laboratory notebook and you get to test your understanding by changing the lung models and seeing how that is reflected in the waveform. So I think that's that's wonderful. We are working on uh, um, offering the, we actually have four levels of SABA right now. There's one that's a team-based learning, there's a simulation-based learning, I'm currently working on a mastery level where we're looking at uh, rare skills like placing esophageal balloon, volumetric capnography, PAV, NAVA, high frequency oscillation, all those kinds of things. And those are going to be pretty much going to have to be in person at our simulation center or at a simulation center. But yeah, good question. I thank you for asking that. Okay, Rob, I think our time is up. We've had lots of good questions, but again, a great lecture. And I hope that everybody um, goes away with some sort of stimulation. Um, again, thanks so much. And thanks everybody for, for attending. And you can feel free to contact me at my email to Cleveland Clinic. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that might come up. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.